The content of this presentation is proprietary and confidential information of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative. It is not intended to be distributed by any party without the written consent of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative. Attendees should note that the educational component of this session is being recorded and will be published on our website and YouTube page. To maintain complete confidentiality, an announcement will be made before the recording begins and only the presenter will be identified during the recording. Therefore, to ensure your anonymity, all attendees are asked to mute their microphones until an announcement is made that the recording is complete. Presentations are intended for the educational purpose only and do not replace the independent pro professional judgment. The ideas expressed in this presentation are the professional opinion of the presenters and do not necessarily represent those of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Co Collaborative or its constituents. Before acting on any of the information presented, attendees should consider the appropriateness of the information as it pertains to their individual situations and seek independent professional advice should any concerns arise. If you or anyone you know are in what is believed or per perceived to be a situation that is or may become harmful, please reach out to the National Domestic Violence Hotline via phone at 1-800-799-SAFE 1-800-799-7233 or through their website hotline.org or dial 911 in the event of the, an emergency. That said, tonight we are grateful to have um, Dan DeGrice and Chap Chaplain Christopher Jones from Rosecrans Florian Program in <laughs> Illinois join us um, to discuss vi vicarious trauma. Um, I'd love for you guys to introduce yourself and take your presentation. All right, well, I'll start off. Uh, I'm the color commentator. My name is Dan DeGrace, and CC is, uh, and from my standpoint, the, the GEO, the Grand Exalted One. He's the chaplain, and he is going to do the bulk of the training here. But uh, for those of you that don't know me, I spent 30 years in the fire service, uh, retired November 3rd of 2019. It's the best thing I ever did. Not only joined the fire service, but retired. And I have been in the world of behavioral health for the last 34 years. And I'll tell you in a second um, why vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. If you joined me, what was it, two months ago when we talked about substance use disorder, I uh, enjoyed it. But um, I first want to say Michelle, the Florida Collaborative, and Chris Bader, and all the other people that have created this Florida Collaborative are friggin' rock stars. Having been in this field of behavioral health for 34 years and then running my the, the Chicago Firefighters Union EAP program and having peer supporters and been, you know, traveling across the country, uh, you know, people talk about the tip of the spear. Uh, you guys are uh, rock stars, rocking it out of here. And it's been long needed. Chris and I have had several conversations, Michelle, and probably maybe a few others. And, and um, something that we don't talk about is this, this vicarious secondary trauma. Uh, people talk about primary trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic stress. You hear about post-traumatic growth. I actually reached out to Michelle and said, uh, hey, uh, do you have anybody that's talked about secondary trauma or vicarious trauma? And um, I, I said, if you don't, I have the guy. And I'd be happy to be a part of it. Before I say something about CC and he introduces himself and gets started. Just want to say that, uh, as Michelle has said, I started the Florian program with Rosecrans six years ago for for firefighters and paramedics and has morphed into all uniformed service personnel that are dealing with substance use disorder and mental health issues. What I didn't know back then uh, and before that is that we suffer from secondary trauma and vicarious trauma from not only the job, but from other things too. Parents do as well. Every, nobody is unaffected by uh, secondary trauma. The question is, is how much you're affected by, and we'll kind of talk about that. So I learned about this about six years ago. It's implemented into our Florian program for the people that stay with us for 25 to 35 days. And it was started by a chaplain and now is continued with chaplain Chris, who it is wonderful, and I wanted to bring him and let him have an opportunity to, to share more. So, Chaplain Chris, 
has a master's in divinity. He was uh, a serviceman eight years in the in the army, and presently is the director of our chaplaincy for all of Rosecrans, all 60 sites across three states. Um, so, Chaplain Chris. Good evening, everyone. It is a joy uh, to be with uh, with all of you. Greetings uh, from uh, Illinois, and um, I'm excited to be with you uh, here today. Uh, Prior to um, being a chaplain at Rosecrans, uh, I served as a United Methodist uh, pastor um, within the Northern Illinois Conference. And um, I have worked with first responders uh, and their families. Um, I have uh, supported them, uh, married them, uh, buried them, counseled them, uh, and really, um, and, and have been friends with them. And um, it is, um, it's interesting in that uh, over those 20 years of uh, friendship and uh, support uh, to the uh, first responders uh, and their families, I've not ever heard any of the first responders truly talk about how they have been affected uh, about uh, from the work that they do. And, um, what I did uh, hear and see was the effects of that. So while they did not verbalize uh, any of that, I uh, began to hear and see and um, began to work with them in addressing those, um, those issues and concerns around that. And so secondary uh, trauma, vicarious trauma is, is a very real thing uh, although there's not a whole lot uh, that have been uh, talked about it, and we'll we'll learn a little bit more about that as we uh, as we go forward. Um, it is true that all of us, in one way or another, uh, we have been uh, we've experienced some form of trauma, um, uh, whatever level, uh, and and many types throughout our uh, lives, and all of us in one way or another where we were whether we are aware of it or not have been exposed and have experienced secondary uh or vicarious trauma um every day all of us in one way or another um we're we're at risk uh and some of us are more uh at risk than others uh so we we're going to dive into uh, the presentation that was just an opening for you to to begin to uh, think about uh, the people in your lives, uh, think about even your own life. And if you can take one thing from today um, as we go throughout this uh, presentation, if our presentation causes you to ask questions uh, about others, uh, about yourself, if it leads you to do some really good self-reflection uh, in terms of your work, in terms of uh, what you're exposed to, uh, your family uh, circles, friendship circles, uh, your environment, um, all of the above, then mission accomplished tonight. Mission accomplished tonight. So um, let, us, um, let us begin. secondary uh, and vicarious trauma. So um, you will hear um, um, interchangeably uh, secondary uh, trauma, vicarious trauma. Uh, they are relatable terms, but secondary trauma uh, as uh, uh, compared to direct trauma, this is indirect exposure to, uh, to trauma through a firsthand account uh, of any type of uh, traumatic uh, event. Um, and um, vicarious trauma um, is the, the gradual change, it's a cumulative experience uh, that happens over time uh, with, uh, uh, with a person as a result of the continuous exposure uh, to somebody else's experience. So um, what we like to say about secondary and vicarious trauma is that um, you are experiencing uh, the 
the trauma of uh, the individual as though you are going through it yourself, even though you are not experiencing it. Um, and we'll learn at some of, we'll learn about some of the ways in which that can happen through the various uh, experiences. So some other related terms um, that you might hear or may have heard uh, are um, indirect uh, secondary stress or trauma, uh, vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, or uh, burnout. Uh, and uh, they all relate to the effect of stress that's, that's on the body, that, that, that's on the mind, uh, that is on uh, the spirit. Uh, so um, we all have experienced stress. We all cope with it uh, differently. And this has a factor on um, how we respond uh, and what we experience in terms of um, secondary or vicarious trauma. So looking at these uh, terms that are different but yet uh, similar, uh, secondary trauma can occur unexpectedly or suddenly. And um, it, it tends to have some development of the PTSD symptoms, whereas vicarious trauma accumulates over time and that typically involves a a shift in your world view as you look at your particular world your environment uh in which uh in which you live um and um when you look at both of those you can see that whether it's suddenly whether it accumulates over time um they we are all impacted we're all affected in one way or another. And uh, depending on the work uh, that we do, um, depending on the environment uh, in which uh, we live and how we interact and engage, uh, um, some, uh, some persons uh, can uh, have this uh, happen uh, much more often uh, than others uh, based on the field uh, that they are um, working in. CC, if I could jump in as a second, is of this, course this is a piece where uh, for many of the first responders that we have when we do this group for them, uh, many of them will say, "Well, I see somebody suffer, but it didn't happen to me." And I'm like, "Yeah, that primary trauma didn't happen to you." But if you, as you'll see in this presentation, if you hear about it and see the behavior that a person exhibits when they kind of share those stories, that could be transferred to you. Um, and then the accumula accumulation that we talk, we talk about the cumulative effect. Uh, so if you work overtime and if you work uh, in the field, uh, in two different departments, or and or you're a family member of somebody that's suffering, either elder care or a son or daughter or a spouse. Um, presently, we have a member on our floor whose spouse has MS, and that's a constant struggle for both people. Um, so just don't look at it singular from the side of the first responder think about the fact that you can be exposed to vicarious and secondary trauma in all aspects of wherever you are at uh, including uh, parents or brothers and sisters and so forth thank you dan uh, one of the examples i like to uh to highlight around um secondary and vicarious trauma uh, actually relates to um, uh, this past week there was uh, a storm that happened um, came through the Gulf uh, of Mexico and hit Louisiana and Texas and some of the rest of the country still experiencing the effects of it um, well um, I, I speak of Hurricane Katrina and the storm that uh, just uh, passed through Hurricane Laura came through the exact same time 
that Hurricane Katrina came in New Orleans. And what we learned uh, from that was that this caused and had the, the strong potential of causing secondary trauma and vicarious trauma for those persons who had experienced Hurricane Katrina, even though that was many years later, even though they were not in Louisiana, they were still affected and impacted by learning this storm was coming right at the same time that they had experienced um, Hurricane Katrina as well. Uh, so um, it could be far removed. Uh, it could be uh, yesterday, uh, a month ago. Um, we are all uh, impacted one way or another, and the potential uh, can happen anytime. So um, what are some of the um, contributing factors? Sort of um, how does this um, secondary uh, vicarious trauma happen? Um, well, um, some of the things that relate to that uh, would be looking at uh, the the nature and the quantity of the exposure um, um, in terms of, of the trauma. Um, um, how often are you uh, exposed to it uh, and what type of trauma it might be? Also, the, the your professional identity, um, as you can look at, at this list, um, what do you do? Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, some, some professions um, are much more at risk uh, of secondary vicarious trauma um, in addition to first responders and their families. Looking at your current life circumstances, um, uh, your, your environment, where you live, uh, how you live, what's going on within uh, the family, what are the things that are happening within the family that's causing uh, stress and, and worry and anxiety. Um, looking at your history, that could be a part, your, your biological, social, medical, and mental history. Um, and, and a huge uh, piece here is your, your coping style. How do you cope with, with stress? How do you cope with um, the, the things that are happening in your life um, as uh, you are doing the work that you do, um, uh, your, your work setting, um, is it much more um, hazardous uh, than, than normal? Um, and, um, uh, and then also the culture of, of work, um, is it such that when things happen, uh, when tragedies or incidents happen uh, in the work setting, um, is it talked about? Um, is it discussed? Are there opportunities to be able to sort of uh, debrief about uh, what may have uh, occurred? Or is it shut down, we don't talk about it and sweep it under the rug? Um, and then your uh, empathetic response, uh, what, um, what is it within you that leads you to want to respond and how, how do you respond uh, in terms of um, uh, of uh, vicarious trauma or, or the, the trauma that others experience. Um, the, um, there's a lot of people that identify as empaths, uh, the ability to feel others' uh, pain and to what level um, does that occur uh, when you are working with others and how does that uh, uh, help or impede your ability uh, to be effective in your work when you are exposed uh, to secondary vicarious trauma. So if I could add something on that slide. Yes. If that slide seems familiar to many of you, you probably have taken a class and tried to understand primary trauma or post-traumatic stress or acute stress or PTSD. And what's important to know is that the secondary and vicarious trauma have the same, very basically, the, the, the same contributing factors and will, as you'll see here in the symptomology, will have uh, identical physical signs and symptoms. So if you're like, hey, this is a class on PTSD, no, it's not. 
this is different, but there are similarities. Thanks, Dan. Um, <clears throat> so tonight is about helping you uh, to become aware of uh, some the, the the symptomology surrounding um, secondary and and vicarious uh, trauma. So um, we are affected uh, uh, by trauma in in so many different uh, ways. Um, it affects the the not only uh, us physically, but but also uh, mentally, emotionally, uh, and spiritually. Um, and uh, so. Uh, you will find that this symptomology, uh, we're going to uh, show a few slides here, that um, reveals uh, those uh, those different signs and symptoms. And one of the most important things um, that we could do is to become aware as we are exposed more and more to uh, secondary uh, and vicarious trauma is to see if indeed these symptoms can be uh, related to the exposure um, to what we've been experiencing. Now, I do want to say, just because you um, can recognize that, um, yes, I have these particular symptoms, it doesn't automatically mean that, okay, you you have secondary trauma or you're suffering from vicarious trauma. It There, there has to be, uh, and hopefully, you will be able to reflect and look at how this can be connected and is this connected to that so we want to help you to get to a level of being aware of these various symptoms so when we look at the physical signs and symptoms um, um, there's exhaustion and insomnia headaches increased susceptibility to illness uh, hypochondria uh, um, i'll go to the next slide uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, behavioral uh, signs and symptoms as um, as we are continued uh, as we continue to be exposed, um, there is increased use of alcohol uh, and drugs, uh, anger, irritability, absenteeism, uh, problems in personal relationships. Uh, comprised, uh, compromised care for clients, forgiveness. Now the things about, uh, the thing about the behavioral signs and symptoms, as with most people, we don't go around talking about or disclosing that we're experiencing these things, these, these physical signs and, and symptoms, because once again, we don't usually talk about how we are impacted or affected. Uh, so um, there will probably be a lot of people in your circles that won't recognize uh, that you are experiencing or feeling uh, these things. Uh, so the goal is for, once again, for you to become aware um, uh, of these, these signs and these symptoms. And is this connected to um, the exposure to secondary trauma? Yeah, and if I could just add with this, and as we go yes. into the symptomology, is we get our, our since we started the program at Rosecrans, the Florian program, we've had over 450 personnel across the country, 25 different states come in, and we'll have some say, uh, I, I have not had any primary trauma. Uh, I had a good childhood, I wasn't beaten, I wasn't uh, bullied, and wonder why I feel the way I do. And then they don't have a diagnosis of depression, maybe some mild anxiety, which you'll see from the symptomology could be very accurate. But they, when they search in their life and their history, and we do sessions with them, they'll be like, I, I didn't have a hard life and I didn't have trauma and then we'll kind of venture into the experiences that they've had and the average person that actually comes on our unit is typically uh, about 40, uh, 40 to 55 years of age with about 15 years of work experience and we'll start chatting about their job experience and I think we all know we come on the job to do stuff and experience stuff but we never take into effect or, or, or take into account 
the cumulative effect of that. We look at our physical, you know, we, we get physical, but we don't get any mental health training, education, other than how to manage other people. So what I guess we're saying too is this, this goes unaddressed. We keep it inside. Nobody says, hey, have you felt these things, these feelings or these behaviors? And so they don't necessarily know where it's coming from. So when we have this class with uh, men and women uh, from the uh, crisis intervention world, uh, police, fire, military, corrections, nurses, doctors, so forth, then they start thinking, oh my gosh, uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I take care of people that are sick and injured and I hear crying, I hear sadness, I, I witness after the fact all this carnage and I tell people hey if you go out in the rain guess what you're gonna get wet and I say if you go out in the cold you're gonna get cold well if you're in an environment where there is death and destruction you're going to be exposed and over time it will be cumulative and what as we'll, as we'll get into it later what are your coping skills Thank you, Dan. Psychological, emotional signs and symptoms. Um, it's not uncommon for person, persons to distance, uh, to dread working with uh, certain clients or dread going into work uh, um, the next day. Um, uh, a, a negative self-image and depression. Um, depersonalization or having um, resentment, um, um, disruption of the worldview and intrusive imagery of, um, of what they've heard or, or what they have seen, um, relational problems in terms of problems with intimacy, not just physical, but emotional uh, intimacy, and, and the, the reduced ability uh, to to feel uh, sympathy, uh, to uh, have this sense of uh, of, uh, of of numbness, um, and um, uh, so as you can see, this this the, the the secondary and vicarious trauma, it um, it really does affect not only um, the physically, but uh, but 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 mind uh, and emotions uh, as well, um, and. Um, um, feeling professional helpless. Uh, and I, I want to talk about the subtlety of these signs and symptoms uh, that it's not always um, recognizable uh, when they first start to uh, present themselves. Uh, and as Dan, Dan mentioned that this, this happens over time, but, but it's very subtle and it just continues to, to build and build. And once again, if if we're not talking about the uh, the physical signs and symptoms, if we're not talking about uh, the the behavioral signs and symptoms, or the psychological and emotional signs of symptoms, you can imagine. But yet we're experiencing them. You can imagine the pressure that is building up over time, over and over and over again. CC, if I could share, if you go back to that slide, just so everybody yes. knows, before we presented this uh, and before we started utilizing this in a group setting, uh, I was the guinea pig when our first chaplain, or actually, yeah, our first chaplain uh, began this program, she had me go through all this. And I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm imagining you and maybe, and if it's not you, I'm not saying you have vicarious trauma or secondary trauma where it's unmanageable. Uh, you, I think that anybody in this field knows that they've probably been affected it, but if you look at uh, feeling professional helplessness or helpless uh, with, I know in my first year on, uh, on the department where I did CPR 10 times and no one survived because no one said that pretty much when you're dead, you're dead. Uh, and then you look at reduced ability to feel sympathy. I'm assuming that too, we could add in there empathy as well. But I, I know all of you probably know a medic who, or maybe you felt yourself that 
after the hundredth drug overdose that you've intervened on, your view of that has changed a little bit. But and if you're like me as well, sometimes I forget that that's somebody's son or daughter or mother or father um, or brother or sister. And those are the little things that CC and I talk about. And again, I don't want to point fingers, but the reality is, is that how over time does this change? Uh, you know, we, we typically look at physically, but we don't necessarily talk about the mind. And this is the key thing because we can typically try to hide this from everybody else unless we have a conversation. And that's the power of what we're, what the Florida Collaborative do, is doing. And that's the kind of the power of having this communication and really what talk therapy is all about and group therapy. And then to talk about something like uh, depersonalization of that when you're working on somebody, if you think about that person as a human being, uh, that tugs at your heart, uh, especially if you don't have a high success rate or survival rate. So you kind of have to look at it as just a job. But if that happens too much and too often, you become depersonalized and distant and then that could lead into, you know, dread of working with certain clients. When that call comes over the, however you get the call, and you're like, oh, a psych call again, or oh, an overdose again, or oh, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, a drowning or a suicide, and, and, and it's cumulative. I also want to add that um, there's another aspect to these uh psychological and emotional signs and symptoms. So the inability uh, as a worker who was experiencing this to be able to uh, share and express and talk with uh, their their families or, or loved one uh, about this, uh, this can also cause those loved ones to have some of the same uh, uh, behavioral, psychological, emotional uh, responses and reactions. So because of the distancing of the, the, the worker, the loved one can also start to distance. Uh, the loved one can also start to dread the, the worker going to work or, or working with specific type of clients. Um, the 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 loved one based on what um they do for work can also feel professionally helpless because they don't have the um uh the either the ability the strength uh or or the resources um or even allowed to help their uh their loved one who is the worker and they can also then um depersonalize uh their um, their loved one uh, to just look at them as this is a person that works with these uh, people or is in this type of uh, work setting. So the, the 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 real important thing is to um, as as we are exposed um, as we are learning about these uh, signs and symptoms to start doing some exploration. Uh, and to become aware of what we're feeling, uh, what we're thinking, um, what's happening to us, and be able to engage in some form of conversation, discussion, questioning, um, exploring, so that uh, we can get the necessary help uh, that is needed. Uh, and in turn, will also then help our families and those relationships. So there's a few more um, psychological and emotional signs and symptoms, and and as you uh, can see this uh, this this list, uh, th there is that the hypersensitivity to uh, emotionally charged material, uh, a heightened anxiety, uh, a loss of hope uh, and uh, cynicism, uh, reduced ability to feel empathy. And and um, and a large one, uh, guilt, uh, carrying uh, the what I what I did not do, what I was not able to accomplish, or or um, 
not able to save someone, um, or I'm still alive and the person is not, uh, but carrying all of that uh, inside, all of those, uh, these signs and symptoms definitely uh, can affect us uh, in the work that we do as we are um, exposed uh, to uh, secondary uh, vicarious trauma. CC, can you uh, explain and he knew? I always say, and he oh, well, knew. So, the, um, you know, that that, that is the, sorry, I um, <laughs> the... I know the, what I mean, but I, I can't say it. <laughs> the, the, the inability uh, to uh, experience uh, pleasure. Uh, so it is the, the, the numbness so much of, of the things that used to bring pleasure to one's life uh, no longer does. Um, so it's the inability to, uh, to experience uh, pleasure in pleasurable things. Um, and um and and that's 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 huge uh so that there's also sort of like a um there's all there's like a physical affect of uh, an expression on one's face and there's just no no emotion no pleasure uh whatsoever um is that and, my face uh, cc say that again is that my face is that no <laughs> no, and I, and I no that is not <laughs> no i, I that actually is, I make light of it only because, and I'll be honest with you, is that for many years, my wife would say to me, uh, what the heck are you thinking? And it, she's like, because I can't read your face. It's just flat. And I wish I knew this. I wish I had this slide. I wish I had this information 15 years ago to better understand that. Um, and now sometimes when I'm working with people, I'll tell people, look in the mirror. and look at your face and see what you see because how can and the reality is how can you not be affected with all the things that we see and we wear it some people wear it with a happy face and it's too jolly and they're hurting inside and other ones you know wear it with what i do which is kind of a flat affect in, in many different arenas but uh there there are a lot of signs and symptoms obviously that i have related to over the years and that one that one's a that one's right at the top mm -hmm. and i want to say it's a part of this uh uh and he ad hedonia is that i choose not to engage in pleasurable things because why should i when so many people are suffering so many people are are dying and hurting and and here i am um enjoying uh um a pleasurable life and enjoying in uh these these various types of of activities that that's bringing joy to my life and i'm surrounded um by um uh, by suffering and pain and it may not be that you truly are surrounded so much by it but it's the accumulative effect of it that gives the appearance and the feeling that you are surrounded by so much uh loss or pain trauma or what have you uh so and once again if we are not uh acknowledging these uh becoming aware of these symptoms if we're not talking about them but they are steadily growing you can imagine that uh the pressure is building and building and building until an explosion happens yeah uh, as we get to it right cc we'll talk about how that needs to be released everybody knows when they drive their car and their tires heat up the pressure builds up and then when it cools down, the pressure reduces. Uh, it's the same thing with us, is that there has to be a cool down period. But for many of us, how, if it's not there, how, how are you intentional to make that cool down period? So we want to talk about ways um, and strategies that can uh help us uh to uh not necessarily limit the exposure uh 
but to to limit the effects of the exposure um, of the trauma uh, that uh, that we experience. So some of the strategies, um, and this is going to look very differently for each and every one of us. Uh, th th there's no cookie cutter uh, way um, how this happens, but the, the important thing is to um, uh, the important thing is to uh, to engage in uh, these uh, particular strategies. Uh, so, um, as you look at it, we got psychoeducational, clinical supervision, and ongoing skills. Uh, looking at the creation of a, a balanced caseload, if you are able to, um, self-care accountability uh, system. Um, uh, use of evidence-based practices, uh, exercise, and uh, good nutrition. Um, looking at others, um, what can we do to build uh, resilience? Uh, so one of the things is to strive for work-life balance. Um, our lives uh, should not be all work. Uh, and our lives should not be all uh, fun and pleasure. We've got to be able to strike that, uh, that balance. And then um, looking at how do I practice self-care, uh, which is extremely uh, important. Um, do I exercise? Do I relax or allow myself to relax? Do I meditate? Uh, what are some of the ways and uh, how this could um, take shape in my life? Uh, the other is uh, maintain healthy connections. Uh, how do I connect with myself spiritually? Um, and what are some activities or things that, um, that we can do to engage in spiritual practices that help ground us, that center us, that uh, allow us to, to cope and question uh, about what, what we're feeling and thinking? And then how, how do we maintain uh, healthy connections and am I open to evaluating the connections that I have to determine whether they are healthy or not healthy? Do I even have a connection or community of people where I can go to for support? So engaging in these, these, uh, these resilience building strategies uh, really um, help us to um, to be able to to cope as we experience um, some of these um, uh, effects of secondary and vicarious uh, trauma. So, um, I, yes, I go ahead. Jump here for a second is that, that these may be boring to people, and if somebody showed me this, uh, shoot, ten years ago, let alone thirty years ago, I'd have been like, man, I'm really not interested. But it, it's key because as CC just said, we can't keep on doing the same thing without resting or uh, um, sleeping or being with our family or just relaxing. A simple thing just to understand is let's just say if you ever painted, right? And you're painting with your right arm and it gets tired or crampy, what do you do? You try with your left or um, you know, it's just a small example, but when we look at working in the fire service or EMS, uh, crisis management, or many of you are paramedics and then your your nurses as well, and there's no break from the potential of secondary trauma, where do you get your rest? We know from our systems, if it's on all the time, especially if you have anxiety or PTSD and you have that hyperacuity, that hypervigilance and your system is always on, it breaks down. You need that, as they say, rest and digest because some of your systems need that sympathetic nervous system to be on, to be working and working well, and others, like your immune system and your digestive system, needs that parasympathetic and for that rest and digest. So for us to mentally manage the things that we experience, again, not just on the job, 
but off the job, going to and from the job, to, to our side job, to home, and from whatever we experienced as a young man or young woman, we need this other side of the continuum of balance. Most of us are extremely resilient, and that's why we put it in here and not just say uh, in a sense of self-care. Self-care is what this is, but to maintain your resiliency for a extended period of time, including retirement like I am, uh, I have to have something else other than death, pain, screaming, car accidents, you name it, all the stuff that is going through your head. So this is critical. And if you're not doing it, good luck with having a balanced life. So there are some long-term re resilience building strategies that we can engage in. Uh, and if not engage in, we can help to create and take the initiative uh, in being a part of. Um, um, if you've not heard of peer support, um, uh, peer support, uh, which is huge in that um, um, it, it's peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, being able to uh, to have an opportunity to to share, uh, to question, to express, uh, to talk through, uh, just to get that support uh, in a non-intimidating, uh, non-threatening environment, but an opportunity to be able to uh, vocally and verbally share um, uh, the, the thoughts, the feelings, and even uh, the questions. Um, um, individualized, um, specialized counseling and, and therapy that is related directly related to uh, the various type of uh, traumas uh, for which we have been exposed, uh, specialized uh, group therapy. Um, and, uh, and the two that um, I want to highlight, which I feel extremely uh, important, grief counseling and grief support. Um, and I want to highlight those two because uh, they're, they're very special to me because I engaged myself in both of those um, in a two-year period I lost seven members of my family while at the same time being a pastor um, leading uh, families through support sessions as they have lost uh, loved ones and one of the struggles I experienced was that no one was asking me how am I doing uh, everyone kept expecting me to do the role of, of pastor and and continue to be strong and I couldn't and so I I took a leave of absence uh, for two years to take care of myself because I couldn't take care of church I couldn't take care of of my own grief I couldn't take care of my family uh, and it it was unmanageable uh, and so um, I sought out grief counseling and um, and I want to say I went through three of them until I found the right one uh, because I wanted to make sure my needs were getting met and that I was truly working through all of the grief. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. Uh, secondly is grief support. Um, grief support, the opportunity to gather together as a group of people uh, we're all there for the same purpose, to support, to learn, to encourage, uh, to grieve together um, um, around uh, the, the loss and, and, and the hurt and the pain and the questions. Uh, and I attended a grief support group for one whole year. And um, it was a commitment I made because I recognized that I needed the help uh, to help save me so that I could be uh, a better spouse, uh, a better father, uh, a better pastor when I would uh, return back to uh, the pastorate. Uh, so I, I want to highlight that. And um, and when you look at these um, long-term resilience building uh, strategies, 
I want to offer two words as you engage in them uh, that hopefully can inspire and motivate you. Um, the two words I would offer to you is to engage in them unashamedly and unapologetically uh, because your life, uh, the lives of the people you, you, you live with, uh, your family members, your friends, that's all important. Uh, every life is important and matters. Uh, and as the person who is exposed to the secondary uh, vicarious trauma, uh, it is extremely important that we, we experience and engage in the long-term resilience building strategies. So I want to highlight right. that. Go so ahead. Just say yeah. uh, agree is that I think we know that there's five stages, right? The uh, denial, the anger, the bargaining, mm -hmm. depression, and acceptance. But we, it can get mixed up too. It's on a continuum. The problem with that is that we don't know the timeline. And mm -hmm. the reason I say that for us specifically is in the fire service, in a 24 hour shift or a 10 hour or whatever you do, 14, um, if you do 48 on, you go on a half a dozen calls, a dozen calls, 30 calls, whatever it may be. You go and you finish. We get trained in that sense that there's a start and a finish and that we get things done and we mitigate it and we move on. And that starts to carry over in our life is that we want to start a project and finish it. And what do we typically want it done? We want it done yesterday. So that when we have these experiences of grief and loss uh, and thoughts process we want an immediate solution to that and if we don't grieve through those five processes it will rear its ugly head later so be in the mid 1990s um there were uh, clinicians um, who were working with uh, various types of uh, clients and particularly those who worked in uh, the human service uh, field. Uh, they were noticing that um, there was this, um, this uh, continuum of clients that were experiencing these various types of uh, trauma related signs and symptoms, but they themselves um, were, had not experienced um, the, uh, the trauma, uh, but they were experiencing the same signs and symptoms. Um, uh, traumatologists uh, started uh, seeing the same patterns uh, as they were working with various uh, clients as well. And this is the, the mid-1990s. Uh, so before, and, and that's where we get the term, at that term, they began to term it secondary uh, trauma um, and, and vicarious trauma. Now that's 1990, uh, uh, 1992, 1995, where we learn of, of, of what this is. Uh, now we have a name for it. Before 1992, um, people were still exposed, still experiencing these symptoms. We didn't have a name for it. Uh, we didn't know how uh, to deal with it. And as they began to study more, research more, they began to learn about all of the ways uh, that the symptoms would present themselves. Uh, and, um, and through their research, uh, Sabatine and, and Perlman, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Frigley, um, now, we, now we understand, now we know uh, what this secondary and vicarious trauma is. Now we know how it, it manifests itself. Uh, and now we can um, put into place um, strategies in which to help us to minimize its effects. Now, because we, um, we engage in these strategies uh, and these coping skills, it doesn't mean that we fix secondary trauma 
or we fix vicarious trauma. No, it helps us to effectively cope uh, and to minimize uh, the, the potential of the enormity of the effects. Uh, and we're talking short-term and long-term resilience building. Uh, and because we will continue to be exposed uh, in various um, ways. Um, so one of the greatest things that we can do is throughout our work, throughout our lives, um, personal lives, every day in one way or another to engage in some form of self-care, uh, some form of self-care and some form of long-term uh, care that can help us uh, to sustain not only our lives, but also to sustain the work to which we have been called uh, to do. These are um, some of the, the resources uh, that, uh, that have been used uh, as we have been um, working and learning more and more about uh, vicarious uh, trauma. Um, you'll see the names of uh, Dr. Figley and uh, the, the, the clinician Sabatine and Perlman, um, and uh, also uh, uh, Francois uh, Matthew. Um, um, all of those have been doing a lot and a lot of research on secondary and vicarious trauma and have been very instrumental in helping uh, really the world uh, understand uh, its effects on, um, on us as, uh, as people who work uh, with with folks and are um, exposed uh, to trauma. Uh, so I do want to thank you. Uh, that is the the end of uh, our presentation. Um, this is uh, my um, information. Uh, if any of you uh, would like to uh, to reach out to me um, for any further questions or uh, just in developing uh, connections. Um, my direct line uh, and my email address. And uh, once again, truly a joy uh, to be with you uh, this evening. And uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Michelle, uh, for uh, putting this together and, and for having uh, me and Dan be a part of this. Well, it's, uh, it's always a wonderful thing when we can get our fire families from across the country and the world together to unify a message. And so thank you guys for making the time for being here tonight and for all the amazing information that you provided to us. Um, with that, we will open the floor and ask if any of our participants would like to ask any questions. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is stop the recording. Once again, thank you so much for making the time for us this evening. And we look forward um, to seeing everybody again next month.